It's amazing what can come from a simple idea. When your friend first brings up the idea of doing a month-long canoe trip in Labrador, it's easy to laugh and not give it much thought at all. With the amount of time that you need to take off work, the amount of planning involved, not to mention that Labrador is known to have some brutal weather and bugs thicker than you could possibly imagine. What's not to love? Our story starts in the cold winter months where we poured over maps and old trip reports, reading stories from the few people that had ever traveled in this area. There's a certain thrill that comes from planning a trip, making a connection that no one in modern day has ever made. You spend months dreaming up all the amazing things you might see, wondering to yourself what it'll actually be like when you get there. Planning for the good is hardly part of the process, but it is the planning for the unforeseen circumstances that takes the most effort and is the most effective for building nerves. Contacting the regional RCMP to let them know the route that we are taking and speaking with locals who warned us of the chance of crossing paths with a polar bear doesn't help for settling the stomach. Also, running through your first aid kit and talking over just about every bad scenario that could possibly happen will also stir your nerves. But whether you like it or not, there is a chance that it could happen, and in that case, we need to be prepared. Our team was about as prepared as we could have possibly been. Now, it was just a matter of getting four guys who lived in three different cities all to the put-in. When that train finally arrived, we loaded our gear knowing that there was no turning around. Yo, this is it, eh? This is it. Once we were dropped at the Menahik Hydro Dam, our nerves were at an all-time high. We were excited to be here, but we were nervous for the unknown that lay ahead. It is in these moments you try to remind yourself that when that paddle finally touches water, it is going to feel just like any other canoe trip. Our starting days required us to travel through the infamous Smallwood Reservoir, one of the largest reservoirs in the world. It wasn't the most glamorous of paddling, but it was a great way to warm up the muscles and start working together as a team. The good news was there was not a lot of portaging required in this section, but the challenge with big water and big lake crossings is that you're at the mercy of the weather. The wind picked up a lot last night. We heard the wind roaring through the trees pretty much all night. Today we're gonna be going in a northwesterly direction and so be it, there's a northwesterly wind coming right back at us. It should get up to about 50 kilometers today. So it's a good thing we got so much distance behind our belt yesterday because it's gonna be a lot harder today. Here, we learned a valuable lesson. When the weather is good, you go, regardless of the time.
Well, this over here is, uh, as on our name says, Teddy Bear Hill. And running it across the top of these hills here is the uh, height of land between the Atlantic watershed and the Arctic watershed, or the Ungava Bay. And that's really exciting for us because we're about a kilometer away from it right now. And that means that we will be going downhill for a little ways after that. We'll be off the lake so we get to go see what the Tapa River is all about. When we finally arrived at the Laurentian Divide, our first height of land, we would be leaving Labrador and entering into northern Quebec. Here, all the water flows to the Arctic, and we would be taking the much anticipated Depa River north. The Depa River was everything we had hoped it would be. The water moved with strong current, allowing us to easily cover distance. That was exhilarating. First rapids. One afternoon while paddling a flat water section of the river, we saw what looked to be a set of rapids in the distance. Based on where we were on the map, it didn't quite make sense. And after Chris had pulled out his binoculars, he confirmed that it wasn't a set of rapids at all. It was instead a herd of caribou that was crossing the river. The George River caribou herd has declined in population by 99% over the past 18 years, and we had set our expectations low not sure if we would have the chance to see any. This lucky day for us, we must have seen over 40 crossing the river. No one truly knows why the population has declined so dramatically, though overhunting, climate change, and food scarcity are some of the top theories. Today, only an estimated 5,000 caribou remain. While traveling along this beautiful river, we passed a number of abandoned Inu hunt camps, with the only recent guests being the local black bear population. Looks like a bear has been ripping through here. I can't even imagine the bear coming in here. As we got further downriver, the topography changed. We slowly entered more mountainous terrain and the rapids started to pick up. The Depa River, by wilderness traveling standards, is the typical route to the confluence of the George River, which would then take you to Ngava Bay. But not for us. We were leaving the Depa to make our way by foot to the George River. This also marked the beginning of when our summer canoe trip turned into a complete suffer fest. Just another day out here in the bush with the bugs. Sounds like it's raining in here. You know. Click, click, click. So today was a special day. We finished our time on the Depa and we're going to be going up the Party Creek across the height of land to the George. 
We've heard a lot of bad things about this portage. It's about nine or 10 kilometers and it should take an entire day. And just to give you guys an idea of what our route's gonna look like, we climbed the peak of our campsite that's at the bottom of the creek to scout where we'll be looking tomorrow. You can tell there's, there's a lot of mountains, a lot of bushwhacking, a lot of black flies. This crossing was first coined by Stu Coffin in 1982 and had only been done by a handful of individuals. We started by following any game trail that appeared to be going in the same direction, but the trails disappeared quickly. Just leave it there. Get it. A combination of thick forest, deep bogs, and mountainous terrain made travel painfully slow, and we were forced to be thankful for traveling 100 meters at a time. So we're in the thick of it now. It's going through a spruce bog. Our gear was as heavy as it was when we started the trip, and it didn't take long for our packs to start breaking. The bugs are thick, the forest is thicker, Every once in a while, we stumble upon a nice animal trail, such as this, and we make a couple extra uh, meters of distance. And uh, we've probably only done about two kilometers for the day. Like, we've been probably at this for like five hours already. Five hours, two kilometers. Yep. We were only completing short sections at a time, and after a long 12-hour day, we had made it only four kilometers. In comparison to the carefree paddling we had at the start of the trip, this was the first in a series of humbling days that would test us both physically and mentally as we slowly tracked, dragged, and portaged a month's worth of gear across bog and alder-choked rivers. Finally, after days of portaging, we had arrived at the infamous George River. Hey everybody, <laughs> we have ourselves a special day here. We've made it to the George River. So we've actually done the uh, Stu Coffin crossover, the height of land from the Depa to the George, successfully. Would you recommend it to others? Yeah, I would recommend it to others, yeah. Yeah. Something, it's something everyone should experience in Absolutely. their life. Absolutely, it's something, it's character building. Yeah. And this is another big spot for us making it to the George. So we will have our second flask. So cheers to the river gods. It's been a hell of a ride to get here. And uh, we're not done yet. The George was a key river in the well-known expeditions of 1905 when both Mina Hubbard and Dylan Wallace paddled from the Northwest River to Fort Chimo. Unlike their trip, we were heading the opposite direction. By the river this morning, I went After the effort we had put in over the past few days, we would have done just about anything to paddle. But the hard work was not over yet. The shorelines we were tracking along consisted of loose, rocky terrain. And though we only had 14 kilometers to travel, it took us an entire day to track our canoes up the George River. All right, oh, Noah, look. look. Oh, oh my God. Holy sh**. Wait, can you take me to shore? Yep. Oh 
my god, dude. Look at the size Holy of that thing. Shit. Dude. <laughs> Whoa. guys that's unbelievable dude how's that for a fish that was <laughs> 33 inch salmon 30, not bad. 33 inch salmon atlantic salmon blew out all expectations there holy slowly we were making our way into the barren lands the tops of the mountains were becoming more and more exposed and the trees started thinning out other than the odd blue sky we lived in a cold gray and damp world. So we woke up this morning, Dave woke up in the pouring rain and wind to make us breakfast and coffee. It's probably about six o'clock right now and we're heading into the swamp to do a, uh, about a kilometer portage in the rain and the wind. We had one good day of sun, never two in a row, so part for the course. With temperatures below 10 degrees and a constant drizzle, we spent our days wading in cold rivers and paddling shallow lakes with no names. Sometimes this was so challenging, we wouldn't even want to stop to eat because we didn't want our body temperatures to drop. Little did we know, this was just the start of the challenging days we had ahead. The Voyager's Height of Land Code. A Voyager! Voyager! Voyager. Rises early. Rises, Rises early. early. And retires late. And retires and late. A Voyager! A Voyager! Paddles hard in the day. Paddles, Paddles hard, hard in the day. day. And eats heartily at night. And eats, eats heartily at night. When the trip is done. When the trip is done. They drink merrily. They drink merrily. A voyager. A voyager. Relies on his team. Relies on his team. But a voyager. But a voyager. Also make sure that the team can rely on him. Also make sure that the team can rely on him. A voyager. A voyager. Works hard. Works hard. Plays hard. Plays hard. And respects the land. And respects the land. And a voyager. And a voyager. Will never sleep with another voyager's wife. Will never sleep with another voyager's wife. Hide of land. Woo! Hide of land. As we sat around camp, we celebrated our final height of land crossing, entering back into Labrador. We saved our whiskey for special occasions, and tonight was one of those nights. We all went to bed a little buzzed and proud of our accomplishments. And all was well, other than Noah, who had mentioned a strange knot in his stomach. We continued forward, but Noah's strength was weakening, and he was consistently cold. After a few days of endless bathroom breaks, he was really struggling to eat and drink. It was obvious that Noah was battling some sort of dysentery, and we took a day allowing him to rest. So it is the morning of day 19, and we're just having a quiet day out here on our beautiful beach site overlooking these crazy mountains behind me here. Noah's not feeling so hot today. He's uh, got a bit of a stomach bug of sorts, so we're just kind of taking our time this morning. Something that we don't get too often out here, so enjoy it while you can, and uh, should be a good day.
We continued to monitor his health with dehydration being one of our main concerns, but we had to keep moving. As we continued our journey, we tried to lighten his load as much as we could. The only issue was that Noah was no longer the only one that was dealing with discomfort. So, I took out a piece of gum this morning after we got into the canoe. It's a pretty standard, for, standard thing for me to do. Keep me occupied while I'm paddling in silence for most of the day. And uh, it was cold, I guess. I don't think it had anything to do with the gum. I put it in my mouth and I, I crunched down in the back corner of my mouth and out came two pieces of my teeth. So after the initial shock of, of realizing that half of a molar has just fallen out of your face, um, got my buds here to look at it. They, you know, went in there, had a good long look. And uh, we're hoping that the pulp or the nerve inside of your tooth is not, inside my tooth, is not exposed to the outside world. Um, otherwise, if the pulp is exposed, there's a high, a very high chance of an infection setting in, which in, in the teeth is never a great thing to have, any kind of infection, really anywhere. But face pain tends to be some of the worst kind of pain. But we have lots of painkillers, and we have lots of two different kinds of antibiotics as well. Um, there's not really a whole lot a dentist would be able to do, even if I were to walk in tomorrow. Uh, so we're just gonna play by ear, go to bed early tonight, get some rest, write in the journal, catch up. Sometimes these things happen, it's crazy. My third broken tooth. Luckily for Dave, there was no pain associated with his missing tooth, but there was the looming fear that an infection could occur. To make things worse, we couldn't find the dental wax that we were certain we had packed. With two of our team members now dealing with health issues and still two weeks of hard work ahead of us, we had to sit down as a team and start having the conversation that no one wanted to have. We are somewhere around 30 kilometers from Mistaston Lake, just south of it right now. It's pretty crazy to be coming up in the, the final stretches here to a place that we have been looking at on a map for so long. And really, it's also a pretty pivotal moment for us, like based on everyone's condition on the team, that's kind of like our uh, the next evacuation point, essentially. So we need to keep an eye on our guys, make sure that they're feeling good, and if they want to continue on, then we need to be confident in that. And if if they don't want to continue on, then that's kind of our option. So we're just going to keep, keep an eye on things. As we sat around the fire that night, we had decided that if Dave started showing any signs of infection, or if Noah's health did not appear to be getting any better, we would be calling for an evacuation once we arrived at Mistaston Lake. That night, the morale was the lowest it had been all trip. And we're camped somewhere around here on this map about right here. And so we're gonna be taking this lake down, have a short portage into another one. And then we're finally moving our way into the upper Mistaston River. Super exciting. Which is very exciting. But then, after that little run, finally hit Mistaston Lake, which has been, uh, at least for me, and I think several others, a major goal of this trip is to see this impact crater and the topography around it. Mistaston Lake was formed by a meteor that hit the Earth at 15 kilometers per second over 36 million years ago. It was a big milestone for our team, and we had built our trip around exploring this lake and its surrounding area. The thought of ending our trip here was a tough reality for our team to accept. The next day, we made it to the much anticipated upper Mistaston River, a river that, as far as we knew, had only been descended once by canoe legends Herb Pohl and Pat Lutus nearly 20 years ago. 
There was very little information, and we didn't fully know what to expect when we had arrived. was a complete boulder garden requiring us to get out of our boats often. A combination of tricky river running and lining was the only way for us to make any progress. There it is. While making our way down this river, Chris and I were following behind Noah and Dave. Now get us to the right. They had managed to sneak a line down a sketchy section of the river and we followed behind. Unfortunately for us, things didn't turn out quite the same. No, we're not going to be able to. Lean right, lean right, lean right. Holy. Yo, I, you got to get out or something. Yeah. We're pinned. Yeah, we're pinned. No, no, no. Jump, jump. Um, which way is the more water going? Can we go this way? That way. Lost paddle in the bag. Yeah. We're done, dude. Watching as all of our food and gear popped out of the canoe, as our canoe completely folded in half, and with everything else that had happened so far, it was pretty obvious this trip was over. How could we possibly continue on? We had our first humbling moment on the river today. We're on the Mistaston River now. It's been super bouldery, lots of like rock gardens. We didn't actually scout this set. We were just kind of making our way down. Nothing looked too crazy, but we have had to make some moves today that have just been like a little risky. And uh, yeah, uh, Chris and I were heading down and we had a rock that we had to get left of and we tried to gun hard left but the canoe got caught on a rock that was actually like mostly submerged underwater and just happened to be in the right spot. Pinned our canoe up against the rock and in our efforts to get it off, she ended up filling with water and then at that point the whole canoe just wrapped around this rock. So we took on a bit of damage on the canoe here. No leaks, pretty severely folded in a, in a couple areas. Yeah, it was just a bit of an eye-opening experience for us and uh, really humbles you on the river. We've been saying it all along, patience is key out here and um, you know, trying to push push down and make distance on all of these sections, um, you know, these things can happen. So that is why we went with these boats and this thing popped right out luckily. Doesn't seem to have any leaks, so we're gonna load her back up again now. We've taken some time to have some lunch warm up by the fire and we're just going to continue on down river but definitely something that uh, we want to be a little bit more cautious of as we continue on. Today was a really tough day. Today was a really 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 tough day and we're now at our campsite we're kind of unwinding hanging out and there's a big mountain behind our campsite that has a view of Mistaston Lake and it's now in plain sight from this mountain that we just climbed. That night at camp we climbed up a hill and laid our eyes on Mistaston Lake in the distance. 
Being trapped in a challenging and never-ending river was making it seem impossible for us to continue on. Being able to actually lay eyes on Mistastin gave our team hope that we could still make it to this lake. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello. Everyone can paddle to Mistastin. It's a nice, beautiful, lazy river. <laughs> Yes, I'm 100% sure it was Mistassin Had a big island in it, surrounded by mountains. So I was cold. Yeah. Well, that's a good sign. I spent the last four days retired in the in the bedroom, as I was in hell, digestive hell. Um, I was doing a number two anywhere from six to 20 times a day, and it was it was absolutely terrible. Um, I, I don't want to get too graphic, but. It's been a long four days, uh, zero energy. Um, thanks to all you guys, all the boys, um, really helped me out by um, by uh, doing a lot of my load when it came to food, uh, portages, paddling. I was pretty much just a sack of dead weight for the last four days. But um, I think I'm pulling through. I'm starting to get my humor back at least. Um, did a, a pretty messed up day on the river today and I feel all right. Glad to have you back. Thanks, glad to be back. Sad to say, but this is where we leave the Mistaston River, heading into Mistaston Lake. We debated continuing on. That river does eventually flow into the lake, but it looks pretty treacherous from a quick scout. And uh, we're thinking we're better off doing the 900 meter portage from here directly into the lake. That way there's no questions. There are no words that can describe the feeling as we took those final steps into Mistaston. At this point, Noah was feeling better, Dave's tooth appeared to be stable, the canoe was still floating, and we had made it to one of the biggest milestones on our trip. This is not the ocean. This is Mistassin Lake. The jewel of a lake that we've been searching for the last three weeks. Uh, did not expect these sandy shorelines. But uh, yeah, this is insane. Like This is like a, t a total ocean view here. But we're actually in the middle of nowhere. That night we were treated to a beautiful sunset after over a week of straight rain. After being on the land for weeks, we couldn't help but feel a part of the system, making deep connections to the environment. In this case, it felt like Labrador was rewarding us for our hard work. Paddling this lake left a feeling like no other. It's such a special place that so few people will ever get to see. It's a shame, but also a blessing that places like this still exist in our country. A very special spot up here. When the fog finally lifted, we had a chance to see how beautiful Mistaston Lake really was. We made our way across the lake, and when we had arrived at the other side, we could hear the pulse of a helicopter in the distance. Having not seen a single person for 24 days, and now being in one of the most remote areas of the trip, this was quite the surprise. When the helicopter landed, out walked a man that we would later know as Rich Martin. 
It turned out that he was just as surprised to see us as we were to see him. And being a pilot who has flown in the area for a long time, he understood what we had just come through and had a surprise for us. Yo, what did we just get? Beer in the middle of nowhere. A Sorry. beer Everybody delivery. Rich. Oh my god. And Dave, you might have a pack of smokes waiting for you. Might, might just there, boy. It's the craziest thing. Doing down the lake and the bird comes over. She spins around and she lands right beside us. Can't believe it. Can't Holy believe it. smokes. 24 days. How far are you walking before you crack one of those, Noah? 24 days and Rich falls out of the sky and gives us an eight pack beer. 24 days. This right here was a moment that our team will remember for the rest of our lives. <laughs> oh my God, boys, what just happened? What just happened? <laughs> Helicopter came down and an angel. Pass me one of those beers. An angel named Rich. Oh my god. Sir, your boys drink beer. <laughs> Do we drink beer? I've had one I think once. This was the first thing first thing he said. Pretty much. Your boys drink beer, pretty much. <laughs> no one will ever believe that story. We're in day 24 in the middle of fucking nowhere. Helicopter drops, comes out of nowhere, gives us an eight pack of cold beer, and then takes off. That is what dreams are made of. On Mistaston Lake, after 10 days of rain, today's like our only sunny day, and we get an eight pack of beer. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> day 24, I don't, almost don't remember what beer tastes like. All right, so we've just pulled up on the beach of this lodge that we were told we should come and pay a visit to. When we arrived at the cabin further down the lake, we learned why there was a helicopter out here in the first place. Rich explained that three weeks earlier, a plane had gone down on Mistaston and they were conducting an extensive search to find it. The plane was carrying seven people, including four Americans that were on a fishing trip two fishing guides from Newfoundland, and an experienced pilot. The mood around camp that night was not the same. Thinking about how the people on that plane were just out to get an experience similar to ours, and now, staying in this cabin where the search crew had been staying, knowing that their time spent here was much different than ours. The cabin gave us an opportunity to reflect and an opportunity to recharge before continuing on our journey. Here we are, back on the Mistaston River. Proper. What shall we see? One of the largest variables and greatest unknowns on our trip was the lower Mistaston a powerful river that drops over 200 meters off the Labrador Plateau. As far as our research suggests, this river has only been descended once before. We took our time around every blind corner and scouted every big rapid. If we could get past dysentery, a broken tooth, and a folded canoe, we didn't want to end our trip by paddling off a waterfall. Oh, oh, oh. 
dude, what the hell? The endless waterfalls and towering canyons that we got to see would be considered national parks if they were anywhere closer to civilization. At this point, we could finally start to let go of the pain that we had endured to get here and feel completely content knowing that nothing else mattered. Unfortunately for us, the work was not yet done and our final land crossing would prove to be one of the most difficult parts of our trip. Welcome to my world. Shimmer no way. Still the air. Keep the quiet. All right, so we've made it about 900 meters. How the boys feeling? I'm not looking forward to getting a phone. Nope. That's gonna suck. Shimmer no way. My hands. Covered right now. Keep the quiet And I'll understand your every word Shimmer no way It's the other way! Oh! <laughs> Still the end We're gonna go back Keep the quiet And I'll understand your every word So the farther we go, the thicker and steeper it gets. And uh, we've kind of started going too close to the river, and now it's too late. Now it's just like a total, total maze in here of just dead wood, alders, birch trees. It is currently quarter after six. We had lunch at the top of this slope, so that was like a six hour slog down a monster hill that was just full choked full of trees and then probably the biggest thickest oldest decaying forest we've ever seen i was walking behind noah and i thought he got ahead and i was like "Ooh, there must be like a clear path and he was literally stuck under all of his bags wedged between two trees like you, you couldn't even take one step in front of you because everywhere was just like a wall of trees it was ridiculous we thought we'd never get out of there and yeah. we just did we just did. It's incredible. By far the worst portage I've ever done, and I think any of us have ever done in our lives. Party on. Party on. Oh my 
gosh, man. How is this an unnamed creek? <laughs> oh no. Let's name this one. Once we reached the valley, arriving at the unnamed creek, the sun came out and we were yet again treated with an incredible river with views that made it seem like we were in the Rockies. This is amazing, this battle. Kogaluk was our final river, and we would take it all the way to the Labrador Sea. Once again, we felt that Labrador was rewarding us, as there were sections that we didn't even need to paddle. This river also happened to provide us with some of the best fishing we have ever experienced in our entire lives. Oh my god! Personal best. On, on the mouse. mouse! When we arrived at the final waterfall on the Kogaluk, our team had bittersweet feelings. While we were excited to paddle the coast, it was sad knowing that we were leaving a land that we had become so accustomed to. The ocean did not disappoint, and the weather also happened to be on our side for most of the paddle, as we headed 65 kilometers north towards Nain. This was part of the trip that none of us had really been thinking about. While we had our concerns around the consequences of tipping our canoes in the frigid water, or the fact that we were now technically traveling in polar bear country, what we had not considered were the upsides to paddling the ocean. There's seals out here. Arriving at our last campsite of the trip, it was strange to think that this was our final night. Home sweet home. Home. After being on the land for over a month, our hard travel and long days became our lifestyle. Regardless of the hardships, we all felt a sense of security and comfort in Labrador. It's crazy to think that tonight is our last night out here after 30, well, 34 days so far, but tomorrow will be day 35. Time has flown by and it is just like incredible. We've had so many amazing experiences out here and this being one of them, like one of the final nights out here, getting to paddle this ocean today is amazing, incredible. And a beautiful sunset like this tonight. Couldn't ask to end a trip any better. We had a perfect sunset with an amazing view and all we wanted was for this moment to last forever. We had two kilometers left to paddle into Nain, and none of us wanted to go to bed that night, holding on to this trip as long as we possibly could. Growth mindset. <laughs> You'll figure it out somewhere. We packed up camp for the very last time. It was sad knowing that the trip was over, but we were happy knowing that we would soon get to see our friends and family that we missed back home. As we rounded that final corner, Nain slowly revealed itself and it hit us like a ton of bricks. After 35 days, and after all of the planning, all of the distance, all of the pain, and all of the amazing experiences, we had successfully made it to Nain. Though 
though this trip may be over, the memories that we have will last us a lifetime. And like we said, it's amazing what can come from a simple idea. She'll be filled with fish soon. But we're out here on the George now. Now it's just all up river from here. <laughs> oh my god, dude. Put that in your Nalgene and smoke it. <laughs>